Hello, my name is Matt Cravens, and I'm a co-manager of the Policy Research Shop here at the Rockefeller Center, and also a postdoctoral fellow. It's with special excitement that I introduce to you today Professor John Gravy, whose talk is on the new voter registration law in New Hampshire and its anticipated effects for state residents here. As one or two of you may know, there is an election that's slowly approaching. <laughs> um, uh, in New Hampshire, a new law allowing poll workers to ask for photo identification to cast a ballot and requiring out-of-state college students to list New Hampshire as their permanent residence to vote was passed in June of this year. But its implementation specific provisions has sort of been slowed down and debated in the courts. As recently as September, many of you may know the Stratford County Superior Court ruled that the new law would discourage some college students from voting and so its implementation might now be put on hold and the New Hampshire Supreme Court two weeks ago made some further clarifications. Um, these laws, as many of you know, are taking a lot of uh, sort of debate in many of the courts in many of the states. Uh, as a scholar of voter turnout and electoral policies, I'm confident in saying that electoral laws often shape voters' behaviors in non-subtle ways that we don't always know about. For some groups, more than others, of course, um, for college students, maybe more, maybe less. Um, but oftentimes, the effect is more than the public would like to recognize. Voter identification laws, such as New Hampshire's, have diffused very quickly throughout state capitals since 2010, and have really kind of changed the way that we talk about elections here in the United States. They've transformed the debate over electoral policies from an often quiet administrative discussion among state and local officials to a national, often very heated and partisan debate we were just talking about sometimes how electoral laws can shape up to be more partisan than they have been in previous years. But at the heart of the issue is whether New Hampshire's voter identification law has the intended effect of reducing in-person voter fraud, as some proponents claim, or whether it prevents eligible voters from casting ballots. Specifically, to what extent does New Hampshire's law require permanent residency changes for college students, and how does it affect you all, college students, and other groups? Several Rockefeller Center students here actually have contributed to this debate this year, uh, presenting a nonpartisan research report. If any of you are here, I don't think I see any of the students, but um, they were actually able to testify uh, in the New Hampshire House on this very issue in March. So it was an exciting time for those Rockefeller students. And that being said, this talk comes to us today on a very timely and important topic at a very unique time and place. And so it is with very great excitement that I introduce Professor John Gravy. Professor Graby is a professor of law at the University of New Hampshire School of Law, where he has taught constitutional law, First Amendment law, civil procedure, conflict of laws, and judicial opinion writing. His scholarship covers numerous areas, including constitutional law, civil rights, and federal jurisdiction. And work has appeared in the Columbia Law Review, the Notre Dame Law Review, Boston University Law Review, and Constitutional Commentary, along with several others, including the William and Mary Bill of Rights Journal, just to name a few. Earlier this year, his paper entitled A Federal Baseline for the Right to Vote was published in the Columbia Law Review sidebar. And additionally, on a more personal note, Professor Gravy is a Dartmouth alum. And as I understand it, his son is also a student here at Dartmouth. Um, this, of course, makes the talk a very special one for us here at the Rockefeller Center. And um, uh, we, of course, hold no biases whether or not he is a public policy major or minor or not. <laughs> um, but Professor Gravy also received his law degree from Harvard Law School and has served as a law clerk to numerous judges with the, in the U.S. Supreme, oh, sorry, Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. Uh, we couldn't be happier to have him with us today, so please join me in giving him a warm welcome. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. It's really, um, my parents would be so proud. I get invited, to, I went to Dartmouth, now I get to come back and, and, and speak. And I do wanna say, I think um, uh, my son does love me, um, but he's not here. <laughs> he, he um, ironically, is at UNH. So I'm up here from UNH today, and he's at UNH, but he's playing on a, a club baseball team here. And they have a, which I love baseball, um, but I wouldn't wanna play baseball at night on October 22nd in New Hampshire. Uh, they have a night game in Durham on a Monday night. Uh, I, I don't know, it, you gotta love the game, I guess. So anyway, um, but I'm really, thank you, Matthew. I, I'm, re I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, I wanted to start by uh, really just um, making sure, especially as I look around the room, um, um, you know, there, I, I already know that there are people here with a, a great deal more expertise uh, than I certainly have about the new law and, and um, uh, the mechanics. Um, and, you know, Matthew and I were talking about 
uh, before, the, before the talk how um, sometimes issues that come up with respect to electoral law uh, tend to be uh, considered a little too much maybe in individual silos. Like the, the wonky people um, will, will um, evaluate the, uh, you know, the, what the empirical evidence is, is telling them, um, perhaps with less dialogue than there ought to be with um, some of the, the, the people who are more generalists. And I know certainly um, th this isn't even an area that, that I have historically written in or been involved in. Um, I mean, my area is, is constitutional law generally and, and civil rights and federal jurisdiction. Um, but I'm really glad that um, uh, to, uh, starting about a, well, almost two years ago now, I guess, um, uh, to have been um, uh, drawn into this uh, topic with a phone call uh, from uh, somebody who's in the audience today, David Pierce, uh, who uh, is a member uh, of the House, and, and I understand running for the Senate, um, standing for election in the Senate, um, and uh, became involved in this particular topic uh, because of concerns that um, the New Hampshire House um, uh, was disregarding some federal constitutional limits uh, when it, it began the process of thinking about uh, changing New Hampshire's voting law. Um, and when I took a look at the issue, uh, I agreed uh, strongly, uh, I think, uh, that uh, what the New Hampshire House was at least initially considering uh, doing uh, was, was patently unconstitutional. So what I thought I would do, um, I think the idea is for me to talk for uh, about a half hour or so, and then for um, some questions and answers. If, if I say something along the way that is, is wrong, for those of you <laughs> who know how all of this works, uh, or is confusing, um, please feel free to stop me along the way, um, to, and I'm happy to, to, to clarify anything. Um, my plan is to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes about what I understand to have unfolded here in New Hampshire uh, over the last uh, well, really since the 2010 elections uh, with respect to voting in New Hampshire, uh, and then to argue for about 10 or 15 minutes uh, that um, the U.S. Constitution and United States constitutional law um, actually has more to say than I think has been fully uh, appreciated uh, about uh, what states indeed can do with respect to regulating uh, the right to vote within a particular state. Um, and then I'll be glad to, to answer questions or really facilitate any conversations that, that, that all of you who are interested in this might like to have uh, among yourselves. So anyway, David called me um, last year uh, when uh, the New Hampshire House proposed legislation uh, that would have created a conclusive presumption uh, that students and military personnel, um, focus on students though, um, are domiciled in the state from which they moved to attend school. Okay, so New Hampshire law was basically going to say, if you moved from out of state to New Hampshire to attend school, we are going to conclusively presume, without any more examination of the facts, uh, that you are a domiciliary of the state from which you moved. Um, does that, that's a correct characterization of the initial law as proposed. Um, and we talked on the phone, and I said, wow, you know, it's not something I know a lot about, but that doesn't sound right to me, and, and, and David really educated me. And the more I looked into it, the more um, jarring uh, I found this proposed legislation. I mean, think about what this meant. Um, I teach at the University of New Hampshire School of Law, which is formerly Franklin Pierce. Those of you who have been in New Hampshire for a while uh, probably know us more as Franklin Pierce, but located in Concord. Uh, we, we regularly have um, mid-career um, people come as law students. So uh, under this law, imagine a new law student who comes from out of state to attend the University of New Hampshire School of Law. Um, she's married. Perhaps uh, her husband uh, takes a job in Manchester or in Concord. They buy a house in Concord, and she settles in to go to law school for the next three years. Under this law, um, this particular law student couldn't vote within the state of New Hampshire. She would be conclusively presumed to be a domiciliary of the state from which we moved. Well, think about that for a second. There's a big problem with that. Um, would the state from which she moved consider her to be a domiciliary on those facts? I mean, she has no intention to return. She has no tie to the state. I mean, New Hampshire can't decide that you're a domiciliary of someplace else. 
Okay. Perhaps New Hampshire has something to say about whether or not you're a domiciliary of New Hampshire, and I'm going to get into that in a moment, because I think it actually has less to say about that than it thinks it does. But it certainly can't be in the business of defining domiciliary status for people from other states and saying that people in other states will be considered to be domiciliaries of those other states. I mean, that runs counter to uh, all sorts of constitutional principles about uh, full faith and credit, privileges or immunities, and the way more generally that the states are obliged under our Constitution to interact with one another, which you know, requires mutual respect and comedy, uh, respect for judgments of other states. Okay, so we started to look at this, um, and um, there was a hearing held, it was in February, um, and there were all sorts, of, it was, it was, it was, it was um, an interesting day, it was interesting for me. Um, there were all sorts of students from different schools, including Dartmouth, uh, in attendance. Um, and I gave testimony before the House Election Law Committee, um, and I opined, as I looked into it, um, uh, it was clear that this statute was unconstitutional. I mean, I think the, the out-of-state law school example that I give provides um, you know, a, a real-life example of, of, um, of somebody who could not be disenfranchised, constitutionally speaking. Um, but, and, and I'll get into the federal law um, a, a little bit more in just a moment. But, but um, just for now, take my word for it. New Hampshire couldn't do that. Um, and I basically got up and I talked about some federal cases that made clear why New Hampshire could not conclusively presume that people who came to the state for certain purposes were not uh, domiciled within the state. I keep, by the way, using this term domicile. Um, this is a term that, you know, in law schools we get used to <laughs> pretty quickly because it's a term that's used throughout different areas of the law. Um, it's an instrumental term. Um, it's a term that um, arose, it's, a, it's an idea that's driven by the fact that for certain legal purposes, the law needs to assign you to a particular jurisdiction. All right, so we see domicile come up with respect to wills, trusts, and estates, for example, because the law of the place where you die generally governs okay, the administration of your estate. Um, domicile is also uh, an important concept in the area of uh, federal litigation, especially uh, under a, a grant of jurisdiction that the Constitution provides known as diversity jurisdiction. It goes all the way back to the founding. Uh, the idea being that we cannot trust home state courts to be fair in cases where there is a lawsuit between somebody from out of state and somebody in state. And so in many of those cases, uh, the, uh, the out of state person has the power either to bring the case in federal court in the first instance or to, you know, if you're a defendant, to remove the case to a federal court where the idea would be you'd have a, a more neutral judge. Okay, well, in order to figure out what state you're a citizen of for purposes of diversity jurisdiction, domicile is used. Uh, domicile is used uh, for a number of other purposes as well. So that's why I keep coming back to this word domicile. Um, in any event, we, yes, question? Yeah, I mean, domicile, everybody, what, um, um, under the law of domicile, everybody has one domicile and only one domicile at any particular point in time. You can, however, be a resident of more than one jurisdiction at a time. So the problem is those laws are, those words rather, are often used interchangeably by people who aren't thinking specifically um, about the term. Uh, but, but domicile, again, it, the idea of a domicile law is to assign you to one particular jurisdiction uh, in situations where the law needs you to be considered within one particular jurisdiction. All right, so you can be a resident of more than one state. You cannot be domiciled in more than one state at any one point in time. I want, as long as I'm talking about it, why don't I go ahead and, and, and give you the definition for domicile. What does domicile require? It requires a physical presence in a state, okay? And it requires, and, and this is gonna sound really weird, but I'll explain why it goes this way. It requires an absence of any intention to be domiciled elsewhere, okay? And it, it gets framed in the negative that way to avoid the problem of, well, college students. What about people who come to Hanover, they have no intention 
of moving back home, moving back in with their parents, but they don't know where they're going afterwards, but they're pretty sure they're not staying in New Hampshire. Okay, lots of older definitions of domicile would say that that group of people are not domiciled within the state of New Hampshire because they don't have an indefinite or a permanent intention to stay in New Hampshire. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem is that that group of people okay, would not be domiciled anywhere. They're not domiciled in their old state. And if we say they're not domiciled here because they have plans to move on in the future, okay, they would be without a domicile. Um, and those people, if they're United States citizens and they live within the United States, okay, they wouldn't be able to vote within any particular state. Okay? So that would be a problem. So domicile is often most usefully understood in negative terms in that way. Okay? And it's basically what you think it is. It's you know, what's the center of your life. Now for certain people, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to know where you're domiciled. I know when I came to Dartmouth, I grew up in Chicago. You know, I, I, when I came to Dartmouth, I didn't plan to move back in with my parents. Um, I didn't know where I was going next. In fact, I was thinking about law school pretty early in my, my college career, but I didn't know where I was going to go to law school. I would argue that I was domiciled here in New Hampshire. Okay. Um, it's the, it was the center of my life, and I didn't have an express intention at any one point in time to be domiciled elsewhere. All right. So anyway, to get back to the story of what New Hampshire was trying to do, um, the bill was proposed. I gave the testimony suggesting that there was a constitutional problem with creating a conclusive presumption that out-of-state students were not domiciled within the state. Um, the bill's sponsor stood up and gave really a, a, a quite a provocative speech, uh, Representative Gregory Sorg uh, from Easton, uh, who had sponsored the bill, um, suggesting, and I'll, I'll actually read to you uh, from his, his testimony on the, the, um, the floor of the state. Okay. He said, um, Representative Forg defended the bill, explaining that it was necessary to keep, and I'm quoting here, uh, transient inmates of a college from drowning out the votes of permanent inhabitants with a long-term stake in the future of their community. Uh, pro provocatively, uh, Representative Sorg also denigrated student, soders as, student voters as a largely monolithic demographic group comprised of people with a dearth of experience and a plethora of the easy self-confidence that only ignorance and inexperience can produce, whose youthful idealism is focused on remaking the world with themselves in charge, of course, rather than with the mundane humdrum of local government. Okay. Um, you know, um, striking, right, because the representative is being clear. The, this, is, this is a disfavored group of voters, right? This isn't a fight about where they're domiciled. This is an argument that this group of voters are dangerous. They're dangerous generally. I mean, that criticism doesn't just apply to students who vote in college towns. I mean, that's just as much of a problem for students who vote anywhere. Well, you know, unfortunately, the 26th Amendment says that everybody 18 years of age and older who's a United States citizen has a right to vote, you know, unless you've committed a felony or something like that. Um, so that's not really, I don't think, a, a, a terribly strong argument. But what was most interesting to me was when the federal case law that ran against his position was pointed out to him, Representative Sorg, who's a lawyer and who took an oath, uh, presumably, to defend the United States Constitution when he assumed his seat, um, basically said, I'm not interested in federal decisions uh, about this uh, because we know that federal courts don't respect state rights sufficiently. And I, I, I remember thinking, wow, well, you know, there's disagreement, but then there's just dismissing out of hand. And, and I say this because I think it's really, really important to understand this dynamic with respect to the student voter law in New Hampshire um, and with respect to what's going on in our legislature right now. Um, Representative Sorg also chaired a committee that issued a report last December which recommended that New Hampshire no longer participate in any joint federal-state programs unless you could point to a, a specific provision of the Constitution which authorized federal government involvement in the area and a provision of the Federalist Papers which contemplated federal involvement in the area. 
Um, now, the Federalist Papers, as many of you may know, were, were newspaper editorials written by, predominantly by Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. Also, a few of them were written by John Jay, trying to persuade voters in New York to ratify the Constitution when it was out for ratification, when it was proposed. It's not a user's manual for the Constitution. It's not a legislative history of the Constitution. It's the subjective views of some admittedly influential people at the time arguing in favor of ratification. Um, you know, we are a country of laws, not of men. The idea that the Federalist Papers would determine the legitimacy of federal involvement in an area, not so persuasive to me. But even more troubling, we see a, a, another idea. Um, in that same committee report, um, Representative Sorgan, he got a majority of his committee to vote in favor of this report. They said that federal decisions, decisions by federal courts would be inadmissible, that's the term, inadmissible in determining whether or not the federal government had a right to be involved in the particular policy area, uh, area under consideration. This is the language of nullification. This is Mississippi, Mississippi circa 1860, okay? And the idea that that sort of analysis is carrying the day in one of our two branches of government. That to me is something that has been underappreciated in the last couple of years. You know, we fought a civil war about the right of states to opt out of the federal system. Okay, and I, I bring all that up today because I do want to suggest again that federal law does supply more constraints in this area on what states may do than has been popularly appreciated. Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that, I, I just want to sort of jump to the end of my talk because I, I actually think I have something to say that's not good news for either political side. I mean, I do think it means that students should have great, great latitude to determine their domiciles for themselves and vote where they believe that they are domiciled. But I also do think that once a student makes that determination, that the student should view himself or herself as a citizen of the particular state in which they have said that they're domiciled. And that may well carry along with it certain other civic entitlements, yes, but also civic obligations. All right, so I don't think it's simply a matter of a college student saying, well, where will my vote count more? The state I come from, the state I go to school, and allowing that determination to guide the decision. I don't think that's the principle upon which the decision ought to be based. It ought to be based on where that student, in good faith, believes herself to be domiciled at the relevant point in time. <clears throat> okay, so that gives the basic New Hampshire background. That law, by the way, was tabled. It was never enacted. Uh, but subsequently, as we know, New Hampshire did take up voter ID again. Um, and the law uh, that you know, I think many people here are familiar with, uh, which is going to require the presentation of a photo ID, a government issued photo ID, not this election cycle, but starting in 2013, okay? That law was enacted. That law, by the way, has been approved also by the Justice Department, okay? It's been upheld under the Voting Rights Act, a federal statute that bizarrely applies to New Hampshire, okay? Uh, the Voting Rights Act, um, is a federal statute you may all know it was passed in the mid-1960s and it was a civil rights statute uh, designed to counteract measures, uh, it, particularly in southern states, uh, that were undertaken to, to interfere with the right to vote along racial lines. Um, by a quirk of history, and, and, and coverage under the Voting Right Act uh, was, was dictated by uh, certain uh, statistics, as I understand it, about minority voting participation. For whatever reason, okay, at the relevant point in time, New Hampshire had so, such a low level of minority participation in voting that it, along with the entire South, okay, became subject to this Voting Rights Act. And it still is subject to the Voting Rights Act today. And so when New Hampshire changes its voting laws, it has to actually submit its laws to the Justice Department in, in Washington, D.C., okay, for what's known as preclearance. Um, the New Hampshire statute that was uh, enacted over Gover Governor Lynch's veto earlier this year has been pre-cleared and approved. And, and quite honestly, it's, it's a relatively mild version of photo ID when compared to some other measures that have been 
adopted elsewhere in the country that are running into, by the way, trouble in court systems throughout the country. Uh, so in a nutshell, okay, those of you who are students and are, are interested about, the, about this upcoming election, if you are, my, my argument is if you are domiciled here, okay, it, you all have a physical presence here, so that's taken care of. Okay? Unless you view yourself as domiciled elsewhere, okay, and that's something inside your mind, that's something that you're going to have to decide for yourself, you are perfectly entitled to register in New Hampshire and vote in New Hampshire. There's still a few days to register to vote prior to the election. It's 10 days before the election, which I believe is October 27th. Is that the deadline? Um, but then if you don't register by that deadline, you can still register to vote on the same day. Okay, there still is same day voting in New Hampshire, which may be surprising to people because you would think, wow, the people who passed this recent law must not be uh, enthusiasts of same day voting. Why did they leave that provision alone? Well, the reason they left that provision alone is if they got rid of that provision, New Hampshire would then be subject to the federal motor voter legislation. Okay, you can opt out a motor voter if you have same day registration. Okay, so um, in any event, um, if you are a student, you can register to vote and you can vote in New Hampshire. Okay, you can vote in New Hampshire if this is your domicile. Um, you will not be required to show a photo ID this upcoming election, though I would guess that almost that everybody here on Dartmouth's campus would actually have a valid photo ID because your student ID is sufficient for this upcoming election. Right? Now, after September 1st of 2013, that's not going to be true anymore. You're going to need, it's a narrower list of identifications that are going to be sufficient to permit you to vote. But still, even after September 1st of 2013, an out-of-state driver's license is going to be adequate, for example. Um, so you don't have to have a New Hampshire driver's license down the road. I'm going to keep the focus on this upcoming election. Um, you, if, you don't, if you go in to vote, in this election, um, and you don't have the requisite ID or you choose not to show it, um, you can still vote by filling out a, an affidavit, okay, attesting that you are entitled to vote in the state of New Hampshire, that you meet the, uh, the, the voting requirements, okay, which are basically, again, boiled down to domicile. Now, if you do that, okay, you will get a follow-up letter from the Secretary of State's office asking you whether, in fact, you did vote. Okay? You don't suffer any criminal penalties or anything if you don't respond to that Secretary of State's letter. There's no penal sanction attached to it. But if you don't, reference will then get made to the Attorney General's office of the state, and the Attorney General will follow up with a letter. Again, there's no actual positive law requirement that you do anything in response to these letters. But if you don't, it will trigger an investigation, or, or that's the idea at least. It would still, I suppose, be up to the Attorney General um, in his discretion or his office's discretion whether or not to undertake such an investigation. But the idea is to create data to analyze whether, in fact, voter fraud is, is taking place and whether uh, people are fraudulently using these affidavits uh, to vote in New Hampshire elections. Okay, um, what's the federal law story here? Okay, you might be surprised to know that for most of our history, there's been very little federal protection of the right to vote. Okay, the Constitution itself doesn't, in terms, say that we have a right to vote. Okay, it assumes that we will be voting. Okay, the original Constitution, the one that came out of Philadelphia before all the amendments were attached to it, okay, made those who were eligible to vote uh, in states for members of the state House of Representatives also eligible to vote for the federal House of, of, of uh, uh, Representatives. Okay, that's Article I of the Constitution. The 17th Amendment to the Constitution, passed in the second half of the 19th century, um, uh, changed the selection of United States Senators from being within the prerogative of state legislatures to popular election. Okay, it wasn't until the 17th Amendment that we voted for United States Senators. Okay, and the same process was adopted with respect to senators as had been the case with members of the House of Representatives. But it's not really until you get into the amendments that you start to see explicit mention made of federal rights with respect to voting. Uh, the, the big one, of course, is in the 15th Amendment. 
13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were the three amendments adopted right after the Civil War ended. 13th Amendment did away with slavery. 14th Amendment uh, did a whole bunch of things, contains the Equal Protection Clause, a State Due Process Clause, all sorts of stuff. That's the most heavily litigated of these three amendments. And then the 15th Amendment made it illegal to discriminate on basis of race with respect to the franchise. Okay. The 19th Amendment, okay, wasn't, that's still less than 100 years old, believe it or not. That's when women received the franchise, okay, with the adoption of the 19th Amendment. Okay, and the 24th and 26th Amendments also make mention of the franchise. The 24th Amendment outlaws poll taxes, okay, which were used to dissuade in particular minorities from voting. The 26th Amendment lowered the voting age from 21 to 18 during the Vietnam War when it struck people as anomalous that people could be conscripted and sent to war and die for their country, but didn't have a say uh, in who was being elected to represent them in Washington. But all of that is just indirect evidence of an understanding that there is something special about the right to vote at the federal level. Uh, but again, for most of our history, the vote was pretty much left to the states, okay, to handle, to, to, to regulate, and to administer as they saw fit. It wasn't until the Warren Court in the 1950s, okay, and you know, the Warren Court, of course, led all sorts of changes in civil rights law. Well, one of those was to elevate the right to vote as a specially protected federal right. It was done in conjunction with the Equal Protection Clause. Um, but we start to see references being made to the right to vote being fundamental in cases in the 19, late 1950s and into the early 1960s. Well, that use of that word fundamental is, is a very important word in constitutional law. It's a signifier. It means that if you interfere with a fundamental right, you are facing more skeptical scrutiny from a court. Okay, so fundamental rights okay, trigger what is known as skeptical judicial scrutiny. And regulations that infringe fundamental rights are presumptively at least problematic. Okay? Now, if the right to vote were a full, unadulterated fundamental right, um, we would see all sorts of lawsuits striking down the various measures that have been taken around the country over the last couple of years. Okay. What complicates things is that the right to vote, although described as fundamental, really isn't fundamental in the same way that the right to free speech is. Okay. What's happened over the past couple of decades is the Supreme Court has backed off that characterization and said, well, states still have enormous latitude to regulate the franchise. And so there's a threshold question that needs to be asked. First question is, is what the state's doing, is that severely impacting the right to vote? Severely. Okay. If the answer to that question is no, well, then we just review what the state's done to make sure that it's properly tailored, that it's an appropriate measure. But if the answer to that question is yes, if there's a severe impact on the right to vote, well, then we do the old strict judicial scrutiny that almost inevitably leads to a conclusion that the law is unconstitutional. All right, so that has paved the way okay, for all sorts of decisions that would seem to be at odds with treating the right to vote as fundamental. For example, literacy tests. Okay? Um, although under federal law, literacy tests are precluded, that's federal law. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of literacy, literacy tests under the Warren Court, and that's never been overturned. Okay? Um, uh, felons can't vote, okay? so you can, you can be stripped of your right to vote. Um, of course, we know that voter ID Okay, in a fractured decision by the Supreme Court a few years ago, the constitutionality of voter ID measures was upheld. So there's all sorts of ways in which the state can permissively regulate. I don't think, I have to tell you, I don't think that New Hampshire's new voter ID law is very likely to be successfully attacked on constitutional grounds. Um, again, it's much more moderate than many of its counterparts around the nation. Now that said, Okay, the constitutionality of a law doesn't establish its wisdom, right? Um, I think many people would ask, okay, is this necessary? Is this going to have a salutary effect on our public policy? How much voter fraud has taken place in New Hampshire? Because the idea of, of adopting this photo ID, um, the idea behind that is to counteract voting fraud. Well, do, have we developed evidence? Have we developed an empirical basis for concluding that this is necessary? Especially in view of the fact that there are populations 
for whom getting this ID is going to prove to be a significant barrier to casting a vote. All right? And that's a public policy argument. Now, in, as long as there's no change in the Supreme Court, no significant change in the Supreme Court, I don't think there's a lot of hope of, of the New Hampshire law ever being struck down again um, in litigation as unconstitutional. That said, okay, um, things could change in the State House here. Um, I, I usually, I teach constitutional law, and I, I really pride myself at the end of the semester, my students don't know what political party. I, they're always trying to guess and get me to tell them. And, and I've sort of made an exception in terms of advocating in this position, not because I see this as a partisan issue. I don't, okay? I think everybody, regardless of what party you belong to, should have a default rule in favor of the franchise. I mean, our, our history is too ugly. Um, and, and, and um, you know, I, it, it's not, a democratic principle to believe that the right to vote should be made easy and that people should be encouraged to vote. Okay, unfortunately, it's being framed that way, okay, given uh, the way you know, facts on the ground are, are unfolding in states around the country. Um, um, but, you know, so I'm not here to take a, you know, a partisan position, other than to say, you know, to the extent that our state legislature Okay, and, and I'm talking about the House of Representatives here, is using this language of nullification okay, in areas like voting rights. In areas, by the way, that, that committee report that I told you that was approved, that was approved less than a year ago, okay, it basically took the position that New Hampshire should no longer participate and accept any federal money for education, uh, for nutrition assistance, uh, for home heating oil, okay, there was actually a, a line at the end of the report said the citizens of New Hampshire are hereby put on notice that it gets cold in New Hampshire in the winter and that they should uh, have uh, plans for heating their homes, okay? I mean, that's what it, in, in, in so many words, what the end of the report said. You know, I mean, this idea, and, and, and to me, even that, that's policy stuff. You know, you can take a very, very strong state's rights view. But this idea that federal court decisions should be rejected because uh, they're not congenial to your worldview. Uh, that, to me, that's kind of scary stuff uh, when it comes from more than just one or two people uh, in an elected legislature. Again, people who, who swear an oath to uphold the Constitution, and I would say that you know, the supremacy of federal law and the, the, uh, the, the principle of judicial review have served this nation pretty well for a couple hundred years, and the idea that we have sizable numbers of people in our home state legislature rejecting that idea, I find troubling. So I th I'll leave it off with that and, and sort of invite questions, comments, conversation. Uh, two things. Back to the question about residency versus domiciliary. Mm -hmm. in the, uh, oh, whoa, I'm sorry. Back to the question of uh, residency versus domiciliary in the current language. Mm -hmm. uh, what, where do they stand? And what arguments could one m are able to be made within the current uh, legislation that could be used to dissuade somebody from voting? If I wanted to dissuade, what could I say and do within the law? Okay, I think the law, my personal view is the law um, is, is, is pretty muddled about the difference between uh, domicile and residency. I mean, I think it's fairly well established. I, I think part of the problem for that is that the terms are used interchangeably without an appreciation that they have different connotations, as I said before. What I think one could legitimately advocate for is that students, military people, anybody, you should vote you should vote in the state of your domicile because that is what state citizenship turns on. And that's a federal constitutional concept. So, okay, it's just not accurate in my view. It's just not accurate that college students should just say, well, you know, I'm in New Hampshire, that's gonna be a state that matters. You know, I, I come from a farm in Vermont and my plan, everybody knows I'm going back to the farm to take over the farm for the rest of my life, but I'm gonna vote in New Hampshire because I can. Now, you can, it's true. I mean, you're never, they're, they're, one of the most difficult things to prove in a court is intent, and that somebody's lying, okay? We've, we've, we've experienced this throughout all sorts of areas of the law. Um, it's unconstitutional for a legislature to enact a law that is facially neutral with the idea, however, of discriminating against a racial minority. So, 
it's technically unconstitutional um, for a local, um, a, a, a locality to say, we're gonna start to administer a written test for people who wanna become firefighters in this state. And the reason why we're gonna do that is we, we know we can write a test that's gonna discriminate in favor of white applicants. Now, if, if you could prove that that's really going on, the, the Supreme Court has said you can make out a claim of unconstitutional discrimination on those facts. The problem is in the proof. Because how do you ever prove okay, the mindset of legislators? How do you ever prove the mindset of a student? Okay, again, the domicile question is all up here. Okay? It's, it's, it's in the student's control. And you can change it from day to day. Okay, Article 4 of the Constitution, we, there's no limitation on migrating interstate in this country. So you could say, I'm never going home again. This is my domicile because you've had a terrible fight with your parents, right? And then the next day you make up and say, oh, I guess I'm going to go home and live. I mean, theoretically, it, it's that fluid. And what I would say is basically the idea of domicile, it, it's really not judicially administrable. Okay, unless you're talking about obvious fraud, unless you're talking about somebody who has no connection to a state like New Hampshire, who's been bussed up, you know, like the, the, you know, some of the horror stories that you hear. Um, but, but basically, if we're talking about choosing between where you came from and where you are now, it's going to be up to the student because nobody's ever going to be able to disprove okay, a choice between those two. That said, however, I do think that students shouldn't just make a strategic choice. I think they should say, what's the center of my life? Okay, and then they should do, you know, that, that, that affords them certain privileges, like voting, but it also can impose on them certain obligations. Okay, and if that domicile doesn't change, well then, look, you're a citizen of the state. You should be subjected to the same laws and the same expectations that other citizens of the state are as well. I'm sympathetic to that argument. You could say that, I think that's, I think that's, but I think that's the limit of it because I think, I think it's a matter of state citizenship and we decided a long time ago that people within the United States should be permitted to freely travel and relocate and change their state citizenship so long as they have United States citizenship, um, really at their own will. I thought that the New Hampshire law required that in the case of students that they would have to um, attest to the fact that if they had an out-of-state driver's license that they were going to commit themselves as if they were residents, which seems to be contrary to the concept of uh, domiciliary. They, they, and they, is that, const you know, are they then tr treading on, uh, on a particular group? I mean, um, we, met, we mentioned two groups, the, the military families and students, right. as, and the question is, is the, the law almost seems to target those. I mean, I'm looking at it perhaps narrowly, and if, it, if they're being targeted, while it might not be targeted in the racial terms, they're still picking out a, a specific population and trying to disenfranchise them. Absolutely. I, yeah, there's a couple of things that I'd like, that you mentioned that I'd like to unwind. I, as to your latter point, absolutely, and the Constitution prohibits that. There are no disfavored voters. So long as you are eligible to vote, okay, the local polity cannot make a decision, this group of voters is favored because we think they do a better job with their vote than this group. That would raise an equal protection problem. And I think that's at the heart of what some of these challenges are. You had asked about the, the, the specific provision about registering your car. That's not written into the statute, but that was, there was language to that effect, okay, that was put on the voter registration form. And that's the subject of the lawsuit that's been filed by the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union, okay? Uh, and that reference was made to that at the beginning. A, a, a Superior Court judge uh, in Stratford County struck that down, held that to be unconstitutional. That was challenged on both state and federal constitutional grounds, by the way. Um, so the, the judge issued an injunction. The case hasn't been decided with finality, but the, the judge said, I'm, I'm sufficiently troubled about this announcement. What, what it says basically at the bottom of the form, and, and people who, who you know, maybe you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it basically says, by signing up to vote, you are claiming residency within the state. And by claiming residency in the state, you are obligating yourself, among other things, 
um, if you have a car, uh, to register that car within the state and to get an in-state driver's license within 60 days. Is that? Well, in discussing it with students that we have here in town hall, it says that you intend to get That's right. a license. And so, some, and again, it's by intent. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's a problematic, um, I think that's a problematic thing, statement to put on a voter registration form for a number of reasons. First of all, Life can change in 60 days, and often does change in 60 days for a student population. I mean, you may think you're going back home, you know, if you're a senior in college here, right? That's two months. And then soon you get a surprise offer, you know, to, to stay and work for an extra year, do research for a professor. I mean, you know, and it's absolutely wrong to communicate that exercising your constitutional right to vote obligates you to say that you will remain a resident 60 days down the road, okay? And, and obviously the intent of the form is to dissuade one, I think, from voting, from, from, from lightly deciding to vote within the particular state. So I think that's what's problematic about that form. Now that's been enjoined. That language has been taken off, as I understand, the voter registration form. There was an appeal taken to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court said basically we're not going to rush this. We're going to uphold the injunction and we're going to get into the merits. So they basically sent it back down to Judge Lewis in Stratford County, and that the constitutionality of that language is still to be determined. It's just a preliminary injunction right now. Um, so, um, I hope that answers questions. You just, you just go to whoever's closest then now. <laughs> How can we um, prophylactically head off some of these measures, like what was struck by the by the Stratford Superior Court or the voter ID law, um, because I mean you've talked about the the right to vote under the federal constitution. The state constitution has a very explicit guarantee of the right to vote, um, and um, I'm wondering is there something that could be put into the constitution? And I don't know what the language would be, but something put into the constitution that would. Uh, prevent things like this from, from being enacted into law and upheld? Things like the, like the statement on the voter registration form, you mean? Yeah, or, I yeah. mean, like, and I'm think just off the top of my head, I'm thinking something like, you know, the state shall not enact any, and I know this is not how it would go, but any administrative requirement that would substantially impact uh, the right to vote or something to that effect, such that the court would have a specific standard to look at when looking at something that doesn't get at the heart of the right to vote, but tweaks the process of it, but has the effect, you know, the disparate impact uh, kind of argument? Um, well, a couple things. Um, f first of all, um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about our federal system um, is that uh, the federal constitution sets the floor, but not the ceiling. And so state constitutional rights can protect individual liberties and individual freedoms uh, more robustly than does the federal constitution. Just one example outside of this area, you know, under the federal constitution, uh, police officers do not need a warrant, they don't need probable cause to, to search through your trash, okay? But under the state constitution, they do, okay? Because the state Supreme Court interpreted the parallel language in the state constitution to confer a greater liberty there. Um, and so, as an initial matter, I, I would say, you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't know uh, that it's been worked out yet because we haven't really had occasion. You know, this is, this is a relatively new development, this sort of legislation, but we haven't really had occasion to ask the courts, is the right to vote under the New Hampshire Constitution? It can't be any um, more parsimonious than the federal right, but it could be broader, okay? And that would be initially uh, up for determination by the state courts in interpreting the scope of the Constitution. And then you say, beyond that, could we, could we constitutionalize some language? The federal standard, again, is that the state cannot uh, adopt measures that severely, okay, this is from this uh, a Supreme Court case called Burdick, that severely interfere with the franchise, okay? Um, doing so triggers strict scrutiny, which is basically con law speak for unconstitutional. Um, nothing, again, would prohibit the state from adopting a higher standard. It's kind of hard to sort of think about how would, what, what would constitutional language look like because there's, 
you know, there's so many ways and guises in which um, regulation can interfere with the exercise of a liberty. I um, mean, it may be something that would just need to be developed case by case, but I, that's not to say that, so I, I, I don't have any immediate reaction of like what some language would be that would be appropriate to write into a constitution, but certainly nothing would stop uh, people elected to the, <laughs> to, to the legislature from proposing such protections. My question has to do with the affidavit, both sides. What's to prevent the Secretary of State or the Attorney General keeping like a hit list of these people, even if they respond and say, yes, I did vote, but say, ha, huh, here's someone who didn't. It's very scary to think, is there a time limit or do they, even the town, having a list of these people. Who didn't have an idea. It, who, they didn't, go on to, who didn't want to show, <clears throat> choose to show their ID. Right. I mean, I, you know, state law authorizes the generation of the document. Um, and state law is presumably constitutional unless shown to be unconstitutional in some way. I think you'd have to make an argument that the generation and then retention of such a document um, violates you know, some other provision of state law or you know, the state constitution or the federal constitution. I don't, you know, in this day and age where government record keeping is to the say the least, proliferated. Um, I, 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 that doesn't strike me as a promising constitutional argument, at least. I'm, I, I, I know more about the federal constitution, quite honestly, than the state constitution. I teach federal constitutional law. That doesn't strike me as a promising constitutional argument. That said, again, we always have to draw the distinction between what's constitutional and what's good public policy. And so if citizens were uncomfortable with government, and New Hampshire has a strong libertarian tradition, right? If, if people within New Hampshire were uncomfortable with this sort of information being maintained okay, by public officials in the state, well, you know, the, there's always the, the possibility of further legislation um, to, to specify proper uses and, and how long they can be retained. I just wanted to follow up on that. The piece of paper is one thing. Uh, the piece of paper that the voter will be executing. Say who you are, just so everybody yeah, knows, I, too. I'm Betsy McLean. I'm the deputy town clerk for the town of Hanover. So we've been wrestling with the back and forth of a lot of the changes that have been coming down through this law. And in terms of the challenge voter affidavit, which is what will be executed if and when people choose not to present their ID, that actually, the form is one thing, but then that, that fact that that voter presented a challenge voter affidavit to get their ballot will be maintained in the statewide voter database. There will be a radio button checked, and that's how the Secretary of State's office, for example, will generate the mass generate those letters. There's been no mention of that field being updated, purged. My sense is, given everything else in our election database stays forever and every change is tracked, that that will forever be married to your voter record here in the state of New Hampshire that you opted not to, either didn't have a photo ID or opted not to show it at a particular election. I just have a couple of questions. Um, picking up on what Betsy just said, even if I vote every year for 20 years in the town of Hanover and refuse to show my ID, then a record will be made that I refuse to show an ID. And, unless, uh, the public officials do have the discretion, right? Could you, could you speak to that? Because you'll be, <laughs> you know it better than I do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, what the speaker is, is referring to is for this upcoming election, certain local officials have the, have the authority to be able to recognize and validate the identify identity of a voter. So for example, if you came to the polls, Barbara, and Willie recognized you didn't have any photo ID, 
Willie, as our moderator, could recognize you know that you are, in fact, Barbara McElroy. And you would not have to fill, for this election, you would not have to fill out a challenge voter affidavit. But again, the law changes after September 1st, 2013. And I can't speak to what happens, but my sense is that the discretion of the local officials is severely limited. Another couple observations. One is that many college students are here with a car owned by their parents. So I don't know what happens to that auto registration and the parents <laughs> as far as uh, the state of New Hampshire that, is concerned. That. It doesn't seem to, to seem logically valid. But my further cons observation is that we're very happy to count college students when it comes to the census. Yeah. <laughs> and the state then is eligible for greater federal aid in various ways because the population of the student body here counts towards the, the, the state's share of federal aid. So if we all of a sudden disenfranchise all these students, then I would think that the state would think more than once or twice about, say, the transportation aid, which I'm sure they're happy to take. Mm -hmm. And as I attended that, that hearing in Representatives Hall um, when Representative Sorg spoke in favor of the bill, and I remember at the time, as I was listening, thinking as if I'd just walked through the looking glass. So it was a fascinating. Um, I felt like I'd gone through the looking glass at that at that hearing um, in in the winter of 2011. Um, and I'm fascinated to ask folks, as a law, as a professor of the law in New Hampshire, what do you think happened between 2008 and 2010 in New Hampshire? that unleashed the sort of um, fascinating shift we've seen in our legislature, particularly on the House side, with this, with this new approach to all things state and federal constitution. I have to sort of take my professor hat. I, I don't know anymore. I mean, everyone in the room has, has probably a, uh, um, a different answer to that question. I mean, I, I, it, it seemed to me to be a wave election premised on economic distress. Um, and um, wave elections bring in change. Um, but um, the change that came into being in 2010 was a different sort of change than I think we've seen before in the state. And, you know, um, I mean, we have things going on here like the Free State Project and, and the rise of the Tea Party movement, which uses um, a rhetoric that, that harkens back to the founding about the division of power and authority uh, between the federal governments and the states. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enthused about federalism. I, 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 I'm not somebody who would like to see the federal government regulate everything, and I'm not somebody who would like to see the federal courts completely get out of the business of enforcing federalism limits. I think that's a very, very worthwhile conversation to continue to have. It's something that we've talked about for 230 years as a nation. How do we calibrate that division of power? Um, but what's troubled me, um, and now I'm stepping out of my profession, and this goes back to me to Bush versus Gore. Um, one of the things that I found most striking about the whole Bush versus Gore phenomenon was I don't know if people remember this, but things being said in Florida, this was before the Supreme Court stepped in and ended it. It was quite clear to me that the legislature in Florida was not going to recognize the validity of the Florida Supreme Court's determination about the meaning of Florida law. Okay? That's judicial review. That's at the state level. But we have since Marbury versus Madison, and it's the same thing in all the states, we have said that the, the last word about the meaning of law okay, belongs to the judiciary. And everybody who's a citizen of the United States has at times chafed at what some court has said about the meaning of the law. Okay? I mean, I, don't, I can tick off the, you know, there are people in, in the abortion context, in Citizens United and Free Speech, the, you know, the healthcare decision. 
you know, you win and you lose. But what I was, I found really, really striking during that time was there was this articulation that we're not going to accept it. We're not going to accept it because the Florida Supreme Court, if you remember at the time, was mostly appointed by Democrats. That was, it was being articulated in partisan terms. And therefore, we're not going to accept it because the Florida legislature, I'm not saying everybody was willing to do it, but that sort of talk was taking place at the time. And Richard Posner, who's a famous federal judge, has actually written a book saying the Supreme Court actually did the nation a service by stepping in and taking a bullet in, in Bush versus Gore because that was going to get very, very ugly. Because Florida's electors, the state, if the state Supreme Court's holding had remained in effect and it had led to a recount which said that Gore was ahead, there was going to be popular resistance to that. And, and, and you know, to me, I, I view, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in sort of Burkean conservatism, incremental steps, okay, and not kicking out the structures that have served us quite well on balance as a nation, you know, for a couple of centuries. Things like judicial review, uh, things like, um, um, you know, mutual respect among the states, um, you know, full faith and credit and things like that. And I fear that there's something afoot in this country right now where, you know, people generally feel empowered to say, if I disagree with that, I'm going to attach the label illegitimate to it and I'm not going to go along with it. Um, and I think that, I mean, that's what's happening right now, the ballot questions. So again, I'll put on my, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the takeover of the courts by the legislature, the attempted takeover of the courts by the legislature. I mean, you know, do we have, what's, what's the empirical evidence for the need to do this? And, and again, this talk of nullification, it's not a matter of disagreement at that point. It's, 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 it's a sort of fundamental rejection of, of arrangements you know, that we have worked out over time. Um, I don't know, it worries me, it worries me. Since you mentioned that, I guess uh, <clears throat> my wife and I are former residents of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, of which we are terribly disappointed with their recent voting rights law, which makes New Hampshire seem very kind. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't, you know, this whole class of voting right enactments to protect the country against fraud when there's no evidence of fraud? I mean, people cite anecdotal evidence that no one has proved about busloads of people coming in to vote, but there, there are no cases. I mean, even in the state of Pennsylvania, they, they came out and said, the, the attorney general said, we have no evidence of fraud, nor, nor have we had any cases involving fraud in the last Humpty Dumpty years. And yet, the legislatures, which are short of money, this is a general statement, all, all of the state legislatures are pretty much short of money. It's, it's a, uh, a recession type time. And they're spending all these money on voter ID when there's no evidence the underlying point is, well, we're protecting you against fraud, and there's no evidence of fraud at all. I'm not saying there isn't any fraud. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the incidence of fraud, it seems to be so minor as to who needs protection from it. I would probably, I probably should defer to Matthew. I don't mean to drag you in, but I mean, I, you know, we all, we're in this time, era right now where you can, you can sort of find what you want to believe to be true. You know, you could, you can, if, you know, we're all so empowered. We, you know, we're all connected. We're all plugged into the internet. And so, you know, I'm amazed. I, I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. Um, and I've been on this Cubs board um, since 1998, you know, when I first started on the internet. And there's a thread on there. It's the most frightening thread uh, on the internet uh, called religion and politics, where these people, like they debate climate change and, and everybody's got an opinion. And everybody's linking studies, and I'm like, geez, you know, I, I, you, know, I, I you know, I say that. I, it, I come from Chicago, right, where where supposedly, you know, the the the, the vote from the uh, from the graveyard put Kennedy over the top in 1960. At least that's the that's the popular story. So I can't discount the possibility. I, I you know, I read. I try to read widely. Um, it seems to me, as a fellow citizen, I agree with you that the that the evidence of voter fraud um, is.
incommensurate with the measures that have been taken to combat it, especially when we know what the effects of those measures are going to be on particularly vulnerable populations. Um, so I agree. <laughs> Do you have any, is there anything yeah, worth saying? I don't mean to, oh, is, this, are you, is that okay? That Absolutely, I, no, okay, that sounds good. like a great, uh, a great interpretation. And I would actually defer back to your original comment about um, you know, the value of public policy is not always dictated by the law. And you know, uh, I mean, there has been sort of a diffusion of these, these voter identification laws since 2010. Of course, there were two before 2010, but they've really taken off. And, and, and I think the evidence shows pretty clearly that there's a lot of partisan motivations for it. I mean, because they've been passed in, in very strongly Republican legislatures with Republican um, governors. But I mean, I have yet to see sort of a cost benefit analysis on sort of the fraud um, versus all the, you know, the massive sort of PR, um, the PR sort of firms that need to be hired to get out information about the different things. And so, I mean, I would just be curious to see actually some evidence about confusion. How much do voters get confused and will that have an effect on the ballot? And I'm not sure you might have a better idea than me. Well, if you've studied the issue, uh, have, you, have you heard of any people talking about widespread, not even widespread, narrow spread of, of voter fraud? <laughs> um, I, I, I should probably defer to someone who has uh, more evidence, but I think the Brennan Center for Justice and various other places have found very low instances of fraud. Um, that being said, uh, a lot of people on the other side of the, the argument would say no evidence of fraud doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, I'm not arguing that either. <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the court in the Stratford County case actually asked the Attorney General, what's the evidence of fraud? And he said, we have none. So here in New Hampshire, the state is on record. Right, the state is on record, but the thing is, is that the, whether the legislature has concluded correctly or incorrectly under constitutional law, if it believes something and it's rationally related to what they're enacting, then the courts will uphold it. And that's why we saw what we did in uh, the redistricting case, where the court didn't uphold the redistricting plan despite the, what the state constitution says. But it said because the legislature had a reasonable belief that it had to enact this plan because of some other factors, then we'll uphold it, even though, to my mind, it's facially unconstitutional. Um, and that, that gets into the quirk of rational basis and strict scrutiny and all that kind of stuff. Right. Courts defer to the coordinate branches whenever they can. Right. Um, and that's what rational basis review is about. Doesn't right. mean it isn't happening. It's just has, isn't clear enough for us. Right. Yeah. I mean, here, there's no doubt about the partisan roots of this. I, and I, I mean, here, here was the quote the day the bill was introduced. This was House Speaker Bill O'Brien um, on tape saying, you know, th this, this legislation, this was the initial bill, this legislation is, is motivated because these towns, and he was talking about Hanover, Keene, and Plymouth, these towns have lost the ability to govern themselves. That's a quote, because college students are, quote, basically doing what I did when I was a kid and foolish voting as a liberal. Now, you know, that, does, has everyone seen that? That, went, that was on the Colbert Report. That went viral, and it didn't stop anything. You know, and, and you know, the problem is, and we come back to a point before, how do you ever show uh, a nefarious purpose to legislation. I mean, legislation is passed by hundreds of representatives. It has to go through, t you know, two houses in every legislative body in this country. Um, you know, this, you know, I had talked, I made reference before to this, this, there's a doctrine in constitutional law known as the political question doctrine. And it's basically, it's, it's, it's a misnomer because um, it makes people think that courts stay out of political issues, which, of course, Bush versus Gore <laughs> tells you we, they don't. But that there, it, it basically refers to the idea that there are some things that courts are just not institutionally capable of figuring out and resolving. Um, now, that doesn't mean that in extreme cases, courts won't step in and say this law was passed for an illegitimate purpose, a bad purpose. Um, and in fact, the 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 nation protection of, um, uh, of same-sex couples and, and sexual orientation um, is really rooted 
in court decisions which have said that certain laws are, can be explained by nothing other than animus towards the particular group. I mean, that's how uh, Texas's anti-sodomy law was struck down uh, in 2003. So I don't want to overstate it, but I, I do want people to appreciate it. it's very, very, very hard to get legislation struck down as being based on an illegitimate purpose. I mean, courts don't look into the subjective views of the legislators, typically. They say, objectively, is there some basis for this? I mean, and, and yes, you know, is, is, there, is there a public policy interest in combating voter fraud if it exists? Of course there is, right? Um, does presenting an ID, okay, um, to make sure that the person is who or she, he or she said they are, I mean, is that rational if that's the purpose of the law? Okay, it's hard for a court to say no to that sort of thing. Lots of these things are really political questions. You mentioned, somebody mentioned gerrymandering before. On the federal side, I mean, on the state level, it sounds like the courts are at least taking a look, though they didn't step in. On the federal side, the Supreme Court has said it's, it's basically a political question right now. I mean, do you know, like what happened, you know, there used to be sort of an understanding that you don't redistrict until every 10 years, until there's a new census. That understanding is by the boards. I mean, that was what, you know, happened down in Texas. Do you all remember that news story a few years ago where, where the, you know, the people left to the state of Texas, the legislators all left to, to prevent a quorum from taking place? It was all because of uh, an early attempt and, and a successful one, ultimately, to redraw district lines. Well, those have been challenged under the Equal Protection Clause as unconstitutional. I mean, it's quite clear what's happening in these cases. You know, legislatures are taken over by one party or the other, and that party immediately starts redrawing district lines to maximize their political advantage. And the Supreme Court has said we basically can't develop a standard. We don't know what's too much partisanship for equal protection purposes. We're just not going to be involved in this class of cases. Um, and so what we have you know, until we get to a point where there's some sort of national consensus that, look, this doesn't benefit either one of us. We both should stop doing it. Let's, you know, let's devise some sort of commission for figuring out how to redo. We're not there yet. Um, you know, sometimes courts just aren't available, though, to supply a solution. That's the idea behind the political question doctrine. You've got to get your satisfaction, if any, through the political process, um, which means you know, you don't like, and, and voting is really a big one. I mean, that's what was so, I, I remember when Bush versus Gore, I remember when the lawsuit was filed, I told, I was teaching at Vermont Law School at the time, I told my students, I, I never make predictions. I used to always tell them, I'm not going to make predictions, but I'm going to make one prediction. The Supreme Court won't touch that with a 30-foot pole, you know? It's like, well, you know, our professor's an idiot, right? I mean, that was, I mean, people were astonished that the Supreme Court took that case. I mean, do you remember that? You know, a lot of people here are old. I mean, the, you know, this, this, the idea of the Supreme Court wading into a legal issue that could impact the outcome of a presidential race, I mean, nobody thought the court was going to get involved in that. That's why these lawsuits um, that, you know, challenging these voter ID laws, these are, you know, there's not a lot of old precedent. First of all, the laws themselves are relatively new. But there's just not a lot of precedent of courts. Courts don't like to oversee elections. Courts like to defer to the coordinate legislative branch. We do have some cases, I mentioned them in the 50s and 60s, but those were race discrimination cases predominantly. Okay? And a federal statute was passed to address that problem, the Voting Rights Act, which basically said to the courts, look, you have to get involved in these cases because if we leave it to local um, uh, officials, we know what's going to happen, the disenfranchisement of African-American voters. Um, but that's the exception, okay, to the rule, which is that generally the courts stay out of it. So. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go. Hi. Uh, in terms of uh, conspiracy theories and, uh, and voting, uh, if you recall, a few years ago, we all worried about the paperless ballot. Do you know anything about, I mean, we, here is voter ID. It's an identification of people. We don't have evidence of uh, that being very widespread of people voting when they shouldn't be voting. But the notion that a lot of votes may be cast and manipulated and not reported correctly was uh, talked about in uh, 2006, I guess, and 2000, uh, 2004, 2000, a number of those years when these voter uh, paperless uh, machines uh, came to being. That wasn't the case in New Hampshire, but na na nationwide. And I haven't heard a thing about that 
uh, since. You know anything about it? I, I, that's not my area. I, I know just this last week I've been reading about it a little bit because, um, because in Ohio, I guess, some right. machines are owned by right. a company Diebold. that Bain or, I, 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 I've only read headlines, so I don't know. I mean, it, well, is, is that something that you know of that's taking place right now, no, Matthew? No, I hesitate to get into any kind of conspiracy theory. <laughs> Me too, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's all conspiracy, of course, because right. Ohio has consistently many electoral um, uh, administration issues every election cycle, but mm -hmm. I don't know about these current ones. Yeah, well, there was I, a, I don't know either. I mean, so. I read a big report in, and it was pretty convincing, quite frankly, about these machines and about, you know, that uh, the, the vote count was not accurate. And this is something that I worry about more in terms of the, the national vote. And I don't know if how many states are still using uh, paperless machines. But so you're making, they, I mean, you're making more general point. Voter fraud comes in all sorts right, of guises. Exa exactly. And That's there's, the there's point. types of voter fraud that you think should be. And New Hampshire has been yeah. wonderful. <laughs> We right. I mean, purging voting. eligible voters from voter rolls with a partisan purpose, that's voter fraud too, right? I mean, Absolutely. most people would place that within that descriptor. Yeah. So, there was a question down here before too, I think. I have a question on voter ID. You mentioned uh, poll tax, and I'm thinking of the disabled and uh, elderly when they stop getting their driver's license and all. What is New Hampshire going to be doing? if? Now they're not, right now it's on hold. But so in, in the future, do, do you have any idea where, where it's going to be leading with voter ID? The voter ID law? Yeah. If, uh, all I know is after September 1st of 2013, you have to, it, it's you a have to requirement have. then. And there are provisions, I think it's what, going to cost $10, but that's waivable um, to get, if you don't have a driver's license, to get a state issued ID. Uh, passports are acceptable. I mean, a number of forms of ID are still going to be acceptable, but they, they're going to be government issued. For example, you can't use your student IDs anymore, as, as I understand it, uh, after September 1st of 2013. Um, but won't that cause a hardship for the disabled and the elderly? I mean, from Hanover, they have to go down to Claremont to do this? And isn't that a form, form of poll tax um, to do that? That's, um, well, and maybe there'll be a claim depending on, on you know, there's always the um, there's always the possibility uh, for bringing such a claim uh, when you have a plaintiff uh, who has suffered facts, you know, has endured facts that would give rise to a claim under under the Twenty Fourth Amendment. So there'd be other there'd be other arguments to be made too. There, there's other uh, uh, discrimination based claims that are at least theoretically possible on those facts. Um, beyond just characterizing what's happening as a de facto poll tax. Yeah. Sorry, um, you said earlier about New Hampshire's voter ID law uh, probably would pass federal constitutional muster. I'm wondering about um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, how familiar you are with the education component of the voter ID law. Um, I argued pretty consistently that the education component under the voter ID law was not sufficient um, as it's been articulated by other federal courts. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a reason to either amend the law, well, this is during the legislative process, to either amend the law to beef up the education requirements or just to, to, to kill it. Mm -hmm. um, can, do you know, I mean, can you speak generally to what the educational requirements are under federal law for a voter ID law? Um, I think the, the Indiana case, which you referred to earlier, Crawford that, case. That, was a, um, um, that was a facial challenge, not an as applied, correct? That's right. Um, but can you speak to the education component of these laws? I, I don't know of anything more specific than the, the, the sort of severe impact test. I mean, I think it gets funneled into that. And if, in fact, something that would be constitutional, but for the fact that people don't know about it and it precludes people from voting, that, and, you're, and you, um, David make, makes mention of a difference between a facial attack and an as-applied challenge. And that's, that's an important concept in constitutional law. A facial attack on a statute means that the statute's going to get struck down as unconstitutional. Um, and as applied, and, and, and those are possible, but they're harder to win. An as applied challenge uh, 
is a challenge that said, applying that statute to me, so this would be you know, your poll tax example, uh, the application of this statute to me in my particular circumstances interferes with my constitutional rights. And a court there won't strike the whole law down, but will say, as applied to this person or this set of people, it would be unconstitutional. Um, I, I have to say, David, I don't know, I, I don't know how to articulate it other than, than there, there is a requirement um, that changes in the law be effectuated in such a way as to not interfere with the exercise of the franchise. And so there's an incumbent, you know, it's incumbent on states to articulate, to get the word out uh, of what the law is. And I had always thought that's, you know, that was a big reason why they delayed it uh, for a year, because if they had tried to ram it through before this election, it would have been really susceptible uh, on those grounds. Longer term, I, I, mean, I feel less comfortable predicting longer term how a challenge about the uh, dissemination of information uh, would fare with respect to the New Hampshire law. I tend to think really 2013, how many elections are there really in two? It's going to be really 2014. Well, it's just municipal elections. Right. So it's really going to be a couple years of the word being out. You know, again, if I were a betting guy, I'd say that's probably going to be sufficient to meet constitutional standards. But I'm also the guy who said they'd never take Bush v. Gore. Right. So, you know, dismiss and then, that. And then one other quick oh, question. Sure. The, the voter registration statute, when you, when you register to vote on election day, lists a number of acceptable forms of proof of your identity mm -hmm. to get you into the system. Right. After 2013, uh, and, and that, that those forms of uh, proof of identity mirror in the in the voter ID law that's going to that's going to be applied next month, those forms of proof of identity mirror those in the registration statute. Mm -hmm. What happens in 2013, though, as you pointed out, is that the number of acceptable forms of proof is shrunk down to a very short list. Right. So we could have a situation after 2013 that a student could go and present her student. ID in order to register to vote, and that would be acceptable under the law. Right. Walk 10 feet over to the ballot clerk to get her ballot and be denied her ballot using the same form of proof. Right. In your opinion, is that, would that pass rational, uh, rational, you know, the rational basis test? In, that in a that court? to me sounds like a promising, I mean, if you can, if you can make a convincing case to a judge uh, that the way it's set up is likely to confuse people uh, uh, about what's required. And it's going to lead to people showing up at the polls, having presented an ID that allowed them to register and have that ID rejected at the polls. That sounds like perhaps a promising basis for, at the very least, an as-applied challenge um, and for arguing you know, that those two lists need to be brought into harmony with one another to avoid misleading people, it seems to me. I don't, it's hard to give no, opinions because it's such a vague standard. You right, know. but I mean, can't, I guess the, the broader question is can the legislature, actually I think I'm answering my own question, but can the legislature um, set up um, proofs of identity for one part of the statute and a different set of proofs of identity to prove the exact same element of fact in another part of the statute and have that upheld under rational basis scrutiny? I, I think, I mean, the default rule is the legislature can do whatever it wants right. um, unless it causes a constitutional problem. But causing voter confusion does give rise to constitutional claims. So okay. I think potentially, I, again, I think potentially there might be something, might be something there. Okay, um, thanks. I noticed we have five minutes left. This is. Uh, so, so many of you are not students, <laughs> obviously. And so I thought, do you mind if I put in a plug for something that I, I'm thinking people would find really interesting? Um, Sonu Beatty is going to actually participate in this, who's a, who's a Dartmouth professor who teaches the Constitution. Um, I don't know if you know, but, but um, there was a conversation in Concord in September between Justice Souter and Margaret Warner of the PBS NewsHour. And it launched this civic education initiative throughout New Hampshire known as Constitutionally Speaking. Um, and it's an ongoing initiative. It's precisely for stuff like this, for people who are interested in civics, who want to become more educated and want to have civil conversations about the Constitution. And it's just, 
I, 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 I feel, because I'm on the steering committee of it, so I'm being a little selfish here, but can, do you mind if I put a website on the board? If any of you is interested in becoming involved in this, um, it's, it's constitutionally speaking nh, whoops, <laughs> dot com. So, um, but what we're, it's, 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 it's the idea is that it would turn into an ongoing initiative for people in New Hampshire who are concerned about civics and civic education and interested in having discussions about civics issues such as this. Um, the next event, that we're going to actually have a symposium on November 17th. We're going to have nine people, including Sonu Beatty, who's a professor here at Dartmouth, Adam Liptak, who's the Supreme Court correspondent for the New York Times, a bunch of other constitutional law scholars are going to give like 15-minute TED-type talks. And the people who are attending, it's not for you know, lawyers, it's, it's for people who teach civics in the schools and, are, uh, and or people who are interested in becoming trained as facilitators um, who would then go out into the communities and in town halls, like you know, maybe once a month, uh, facilitate discussions about various constitutional issues. Um, and so if any of you is interested in that, I, it just seems to me that there's a lot of civic interest in the room you might want to attend that symposium and think about, you know, do you want to go through a couple training sessions and be somebody who in your town could lead discussions about constitutional issues? It's going to culminate in May. We're going to have a joint address at the law school by David Boys uh, and Ted Olson, um, the, oppo the opposing counsel in Bush versus Gore who have come together to challenge successfully uh, California's Proposition 8, which overturned uh, the state Supreme Court decision which outlawed discrimination on the basis of same-sex marriage. So it's kind of a cool thing and we've got a lot of interesting people involved. So uh, I, that's kind of parochial, but if you don't mind me throwing it out there, uh, I, think, uh, I think it might be of interest to people in the room. So I was just seeing the clock was getting close. So. Um, were there any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm from the League of Women Voters. I just want to thank you. I'm from the League of Women Voters. I just want to thank you for coming. For oh, sure, coming. sure. I really appreciate no, it. I think it's and um, it was very inspiring and illuminating for what's going on with us. And uh, I just want to announce that on Wednesday night, the League of Women Voters is holding a debate like forum at the Kilton Library. It's for New Hampshire, Senate District 5. Um, candidates will running, and it, that is Representative David Pierce and Representative Joe Osgood. So that's at 7 o'clock at the Kilton Library. We hope you all will attend. And again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me.